Thank you. That would have been bad. <laughs> Hope everyone can see me okay. I'm in a hotel, so not my normal setup. I'm actually at Brand Week, also in the U.S., um, but in Miami. So I have mixed feelings about being anywhere in Florida. If you're familiar with American politics, you know why. Um, but I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share this content with you. Um, I feel very passionately about the opportunity that marketers have. And I know this sounds crazy because we're usually the devils in the room in any conversation about um, sustainability and inclusivity. But I want to talk about the power we have, the marketing function, to make a difference because we're going to spend the money anyway. So open your heart to that idea that, yes, a world with much less marketing might be a better one, but given the world that we're in, how can marketers make a positive impact? So if we go to the next slide. A little bit about myself. Um, I am a 17 plus career, probably more like 18 plus career marketer now. If you follow me on LinkedIn, you know that I'm a proud squeaky wheel. For anyone not familiar with that, um, sort of US um, slang, Google it on Urban Dictionary and you'll have a laugh. Um, I'm a founder of a boutique cons consultancy where I work with CMOs um, and senior marketing leaders on all things, but I have a special interest in the power of inclusive marketing, which is why I'm working actually with a British publisher, Cogan Page, um, on my first book, which you can see to the right there, should be out by July of 2024. Um, I'm also a LinkedIn top voice, whatever that means. I think it just means I like to tell the truth and rabble rouse online. Um, so that's a lot about me. If we continue on. This is the kind of thing that clients say about me. So just to prepare you for the level of real talk we're going to have, um, that, that should just set the tone. You just cut through all my nonsense. That's kind of the feedback that I generally get. Next slide. Okay, so now I wanna start with sort of the, the thinking, the philosophy behind this idea that marketers have power to make an impact. And it all started percolating for me when I um, picked up John Mackey, as many of you know, the co-founder of Whole Foods, his first book, Conscious Capitalism, Liberating the Heroic Spirit of Business. And while he wrote it in 2013, I actually hadn't picked it up until the point where we were in the middle of the pandemic. And for those of us in the US, we were experiencing this sort of reckoning of you know, racial equity. And I, I just started thinking about how my work as a marketer could do this, could have positive impacts in multiple dimensions for all stakeholders if we're making decisions in that way. Really relates a lot to the person who just spoke in some of those themes, but how do we think about this specifically through the lens of marketing? So if you go to the next slide, this is my working definition um, of what responsible marketing is. I want to call out that it's different than a few things that people might think are um, synonyms. It is different than multicultural marketing. That is the idea of making sure you are exploiting opportunities to make money from different kinds of people. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but that's not what we're talking about here. It's also not just social impact marketing. Um, it really is about, and I'll read out the definition to tell you what it is, the practice of ambitiously addressing systemic inequities and social impact opportunities in ways that simultaneously deliver outside business results. So it really is about taking these opportunities to make a difference and aligning them to the need for businesses to make money. Sorry, I got distracted by the comment on the right. Do I need to pay attention to that? I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So if you think about that definition, how do we ambitiously address systemic inequities or social impact opportunities? So think of that as racism being a systemic inequity, climate change, or the need to impact that being a social impact opportunity, poverty being a social impact opportunity, the list goes on and on of what those could be. 
but we're thinking about how, how it's relevant to a particular brand. So if we continue, what's the risk of this? And there's a lot of conversation in the US, but everywhere around greenwashing. And is it, is it really your role to be involved in all conversations as companies? Next slide. These are the things that clients often tell me that they're most worried about. Should we get involved if we still don't even have a diverse team ourselves? Um, what if we do something meaning to be right, but we do it in a way that isn't taken well and we end up on this cancel list that is the phantom idea that doesn't actually exist? We'll talk more about that. What if we alienate those of our customers who are conservative by doing something that's good for the world? And even when you say that out loud, you have to start thinking to yourself, why would solving a social problem alienate conservative people? That would alienate people who don't support humanity, which isn't the definition of conservatism as far as I believe. So I think we've polarized things that are normal and natural and that we all want, um, and we kind of overthink it. And I have some uh, proof points that will underscore that in the next couple slides. And then this is the biggest one. Is this gonna distract us? We're a for-profit company. Like we're not a nonprofit. This isn't about philanthropy. Agreed. And so these perceived risks are all things that are perception, but not reality. Let's talk about reality. And the next slide. So you may be familiar with Andrew Winston and Paul Pullman, two other scholars who whose work really influenced the way I think about this. Um, in Net Positive, and this is a, a clip from a an Adweek article I wrote where I quoted them. They wrote that the time is now for businesses taking a prominent role in solving our shared challenges instead of contributing to them. And I add to that that brand leaders who embrace this opportunity, those are the ones who will continuously and increasingly outshine their competitors, those who falsely believe this power is a burden. So it's really about thinking about how you do your job and that is a method of using social impact, using uh, the addressing of systemic inequity to create successful results for yourself as a professional. It's all about win-win wins, you'll see as I continue to go through this. It's not about altruism. It's about creating positive impact by doing positive things. And so the next slide. Some research I did with Sparks and Honey and Omnicon firm you might be familiar with just underscores this with, with just these overwhelming results. 81% of consumers we spoke with, and it was a statistically significant sample, agreed that brands and businesses have a role to play in addressing social issues. And we've heard this a million times in Edelman's work as well. So let's keep going, but there, it gets more interesting. So Su Young Kang, I love her. She's a CMO of EOS, if you're familiar with that brand, um, and, and uh, you know, one of my favorite CMOs to have conversation with. She said something to me when we were in conversation about the book, and it was just so simple, and I want to share it to, to talk about why those risks really are things that are perceptions and not reality. Being real always works better than trying to be perfect. We feel risk when we try to achieve perfection. But when we embrace this idea that we just have to be real, the world opens up and a lot gets more interesting. The next slide is a really fun one. I asked my LinkedIn audience in the midst of all the Bud Light brouhaha that I'm sure everyone all over the world heard about, and it's quite embarrassing for the United States, quite frankly. Um, I asked my audience if they think conservative people are making purchasing decisions based on hate? It sounds like a crazy question, but the premise of not doing things that are good for society in your marketing because it might upset conservative people, well, that, that's what, what you're saying. Um, and of course, the poll results supported the reality that no, just the loud minority of people who are radicals, I wouldn't even call them conservatives, maybe people who just sort of need help, 
um, are making purchasing decisions based on who they hate. And we are not going to pander to them in the way that we market as responsible companies. So we really need to keep that in mind. The loud minority should not be making our decisions. Next slide. So another stat from the Sparks County study, and we're going to get into some fun, quick case studies that really bring all this to life. So I promise my whole thing won't be this boring, but a little bit of setup is necessary. 74% um, of consumers said it's important for brands to help audiences see beyond stereotypes. So just think about that one. Again, another thing that some might say isn't the company's responsibility. Consumers disagree. If we keep going. Companies that get woke aren't actually going broke. This is an amazing piece by journalist I love, Miles Klee, where he actually makes the case that this idea is a phantom one. And wow, imagine that. Being awake is actually a good thing to be, because what's the alternative? <laughs> so you can go on and read that article if you're interested um, in a later time, but I wanted to show the headline. And if we continue... So this is my last like key stat from the Sparks and Honey study I partnered with them on. And it's that 71% of consumers would be more likely to buy an inclusive alternative to a product. This is key. Even if it didn't specifically apply to them. Think about a lipstick um, uh, um, case that's easier to open for someone with mobility issues. Think about a Band-Aid that has a range of different skin tones, even if the regular one works for you. We just as humans want everyone to have solutions. And I found that stat really, really compelling. So next slide before we get to our case studies. And I'm gonna send this out so that you all can read through the detail. But the, the premise of the book um, is this idea that there's a triple top line flywheel. I kind of adapted that idea to marketing specifically. And you can read through the detail, but it's, it's as simple as saying, if you start with social impact, you get the benefit of reputation impact. That generally leads to commercial impact. And that commercial impact leads to commitment. And then you do it again. So this pow powerful flywheel effect, I think, is what makes the case for not just doing things that are socially good because you feel like it's the right thing for your company to say or do, but really finding the things that are gonna to relate to your company's results because that's what your company is gonna to commit to. We'll go to the next slide. I have some resources and we don't have to read these in detail because you'll have them, but questions that reveal what are the right impact opportunities. And the one that I like to start with, it always makes people kind of hmm, think, differently. What are your brand's societal debts? What does your brand owe to the world? And I won't go through the other two because I want to make sure we have enough time for our case studies, but just think about that for a second. How can a brand start to look at what problem can we solve in a way that can actually grow our business? And there are many examples. If we continue the next slide. So these are the four key things you can do. And just like everything that actually works, they are very simple. You can solve real problems. You can tell real stories. You can create real opportunities. And you can influence real policies. And if you stay in this wheelhouse and always connect the actions to something that is relevant to the brand and something that has a commercial outcome, you're going to be in business. And let's see some good examples of that. Now, this is the very fun part. Oh, sorry, there's one more framework. This is just another thing to remember. Um, and we love a 3C framework in marketing, but the three that are most important to think about as you're making those four um, responsible marketing moves, as you're solving real problems, telling real stories, influencing real policies, um, and the fourth one, which we will see when we look at the list, I knew I wasn't, wasn't gonna get them all off hand. Yeah, those are conviction, candor, and consistency. And to ultimately transcend the performative, going from a cheerleader to a champion to a catalyst is your goal. It's from being on the sidelines to yeah, being in the game, but the real responsible marketers actually change the system. Here's a good example of that. Let's start with MasterCard. This is one of my favorites. 
What MasterCard did, if you haven't heard of their true name feature, is they solved a real problem by making it easier for people who are transgender to use their actual name without having to go through a ton of bureau bure bureaucratic paperwork, without waiting years, and protecting them actually physically from what we know are risks of harm at the point of sale when someone presents differently than um, their name might, you know, suggest they should to the person who's doing the transaction. So MasterCard started this and it has been adopted throughout the banking ecosystem. So that is a systemic change. It solves a real problem. It is not performative because it actually has a great impact on the business. Um, and it's something that scales because when things work, we do them again. Next slide. This is another example that I love and it's so simple. This actually won awards at Cannes. And this, um, I, I believe occurred throughout a number of countries in Europe. During the pandemic, Heineken solved a real problem by instead of buying inventory from, you know, sort of billboard companies, they kept restaurants who serve their product in business by buying ad inventory on their shutters. What a simple idea. And what a way to make an emotional connection with a consumer. What a real way to make a social impact to struggling restaurants at a time of crisis. And gosh, the commercial impact, think about the loyalty that every single one of those uh, storefronts will have to ordering Heineken going forward, as well as the consumer who are, who are just getting the impact um, from the drive-by. So this is one of my favorite examples, and it's really focused on the local, which is what we're you know talking about today. So I was excited to bring this one in. And if we continue, if I could have a quick time check, I'll, I'll gauge how much uh, detail I'll go into on each of these. Okay, well, I'll wait for someone to give me one in the chat. Um, but there are a few more. This is one I really love, five minutes, perfect. This is one I really love as well, Google Pixel. They solved a real problem for people who don't tend to show up properly in pictures. And that's usually people who have a lot of melanin in their skin. I've experienced this, especially, and I'm sure a lot of you, if you're in a picture with friends of multiple different colors, someone always ends up getting washed out. So this is a real problem. It is in the space of racial equity, but it's not just saying we support you, it's saying we're gonna fix it. So they launched Google Realtone and all of their Pixel phones and the technology has scaled to other brands as well now. So they made the social impact, they created a catalytic change that improves their reputation, commercial impact is there and they do it again. And one thing I'll note here that is really important is they also talked about this at the top of the funnel. You see on the right, Lizzo, we, she, she's going through a lot right now, so I'm not one for canceling people. I'll just acknowledge that I hope that we find out that she didn't do the things people think she did. Anyway, before that, um, she was featured in their Super Bowl commercial. Um, so not only did they actually solve this problem feature-wise, they let it lead. And of course, not relevant to everyone, but exciting to everyone. Next slide. So this is a really simple one and also has that local impact effect. During the pandemic, Lyft and CVS Health partnered up to help people get free rides to get their COVID vaccines. I mean, the, the social impact is obvious, but when you think about the commercial impact, it's a lot more dynamic than, you, than it might initially seem. Think about their opportunity to sort of get people who are use, using Uber more often to switch over. Think about the frequency effect of, of now using Lyft more. Think about people who didn't even have a Lyft account but wanted to take advantage of this and then you have that customer acquisition. And of course, you're getting rides, right? So even if the one ride is free, the behavior itself drives commercial impact. And I've heard from the team at Lyft that the great thing about this catalytic change is that they've continued to do this for other causes, like going to job applications, et cetera. So that's again where that flywheel effect happens. If something socially impactful works, we continue to do it again. And Uber actually copied them and replicated this. So if we continue. 
Um, let's skip over this one. I, I want to get to some of the um, negative examples. So we have those. So we'll skip the Botox example, but you can read about it. Um, we'll skip the, the Dove Crown Act example. So you can read about that too. But those are just, you know, very obvious examples of where um, I'll talk about, sorry, I'll talk about the Dove one a little bit. A brand is committed to serving its core audience by actually advocating for things that they want. Um, and then even productizing that at the point of sale. So they have a Crown Act product selling a target. So the two really regrettable cases we'll end with that we'll hopefully keep in mind for you and the marketers you work with, what it looks like to be performative and what we should just avoid. Let's start with the first one. Uber did this in urban markets um, right after the murder of George Floyd in America. And it was simply the message, if you tolerate racism, delete Uber. Now they didn't force anyone to delete Uber. They didn't have any mechanism of seeing if that actually happened. It was really just a puffing of the chest. And again, none of the things that we need to happen for this work not to be performative happened. And so the last example, we mentioned Bud Light, um, but I wanted to underscore that. So if you go to the next slide, Bud Light did, they committed the cardinal sin of listening to the loud minority their business is suffering dramatically as a result. So instead of just putting their support behind a creator who they had make one post for them, they supported and pandered to the loud minority of people who hated that person. And there is no social impact there. There is no reputation impact there. There's certainly no commercial impact there. There are always going to be more people to buy right? But if you protect your base, even at the expense of building your market, then you really don't want your business to grow. And we need more marketers to understand that. If you're, if you're thinking in this protective way, you're never going to be able to scale. So as we come to the end, I want to encourage all of you to keep reaching in whatever way makes sense, in whatever ways are relevant to your brand, in whatever your sphere of influence is. Next slide. This is a little silly, but it's always a good reminder that we can probably do more than we do. If Beyonce can find 24 black trombone players, can't your company find a single black intern, associate, or board member? And we can apply that thinking to any sort of social impact area. Can't we do just that one thing to impact whether it's climate change, whether it's racial inequity, whether it's, you know, poverty, whether it's X, Y, Z, or the other thing, fill in the list. But there's always more we can do if we're willing to put in the effort. We all have the same amount of hours in the day as Beyonce. So next slide. Let's ensure that we are not just believing in something, but we are sacrificing something in service of that when we need to. That's what integrity is. And that what, that is what makes marketers responsible and successful. So with that, I will close. Feel free to get in touch with me on LinkedIn. Um, the hashtag responsible marketing usually relates to some of my rants on this topic. Um, and it was really fun to be here. I know I talk pretty fast. So if you have any follow-up questions, I will keep the DMs open. Um, and I'm just really appreciative of the opportunity to share this work with such a wonderful group. Thank you.